For the work session tonight, we have uh, two, two items. The first is a concept plan presentation by Steve and Janet Stewart. They own the Stewart. Their property is uh, located in Original Town. It's uh, a uh, two-acre piece of property um, located at the in, or intersection of Cold Creek Drive and 76th Street. It's a triangular piece that's bordered by superior self-storage, the Sagamore subdivision, and then uh, the Oxner property or Remington Homes development property. Uh, they are here tonight to um, discuss with the board their plans and what they'd like to do with the property. Um, I've included some information in the cover memo with regard to certain zoning if they've decided to go forward with that. but I introduce them and let them uh, just kind of let the board okay. know what you're thinking as far as your property and they'll ask questions. And, and okay, well we've, we've owned this property since uh, 98 so we've had a little bit of time to think about it. And we approached this, the town in 2000 to annex the property. And maybe, Andrew, maybe you were here then, I'm not sure. But, uh, my name is Steve Stewart and this is my wife Janice Stewart and we are the owners of the property. Uh, and so at that time it did not to uh, it did not end in an annexation so we thought we would approach it again and when we acquired the property we relied on the comp plan back in 89 and 96 where the property was uh, it indicated the property would be multifamily zoning so that was a part of us in acquiring this property and at that annexation request in 2000, the, the town council did vote to annex the property, but the zoning had been changed from our request to a, an A-UR versus a residential zoning. And then also there was a restriction put on there that the existing home could not be increased in size by more than 50%, and the home is only 950 some square feet. So with those two factors, we decided to withdraw from the process, and we did uh, we went ahead and made a move, rented the property, and then uh, a year or so ago we decided to move back into the property. So now we're living in the property again. I thought we'd approach the town again about annexing this parcel. It's got, um, there's an issue with the road. Part of the property is annexed. Uh, I'm not sure exactly the percentage, 15 to 18 percent is already annexed. Part of it on the, uh, I guess the northwest there, the north. And that needs to be cleaned up. So our thinking was that we would you know, dedicate that portion of the property that, that the town needs for the road and then uh, do something with the rest of it. So on the, I'm sorry, the northeast or the north? Northwest, this area right here. So th I think this is the city limits right there and our property goes to the center line of the road is my understanding. And, and oh. in the past there was an easement granted for that road. Okay. That right away. And the current comprehensive plan has it zoned, or has, has a designated future use as residential. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a difficult site to design and plan around. It's a triangular piece, and it's just very difficult to get any type of roadway in there. Mm -hmm. um, and how do I change the kind of page? <laughs> Prior page two, we had that map drawn in 09. We previously had, had submitted one in 2000. Uh, this is a plat that we were working on in 09. We haven't we haven't uh, revised that. Uh, it needs some revision. But as this is indicated, it's there's seven seven thousand square foot lots. <coughs> and if you did a multifamily zone, we would probably it may have to be cut back to six du duplex or attached home lots, or maybe, maybe you can keep seven, I don't know. But the property will accommodate probably somewhere between 12 and 14 units. Mm -hmm. Okay. And That's then, all I've got. were you looking to come in with, um, with your annexation, and would you be asking for a straight zoning for medium density res or would you come in with a site development plan? Just the straight zoning. I'm not interested at this point in 
spending any more funds on a plan. I'm just not interested in paying. So the so we um, listed in the board's cover memo what uses would be allowed under a you know medium density residential so just so you have that information as well. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So questions, thoughts from the board. I was just asking Phyllis. I'm having a hard time. Seem visualizing where this is. Yeah, one w that is probably helpful. So, can you point out where uh, where Oxner is, where the storage okay, area the, is? The and storage is, is right here to the south, mm -hmm. and the Oxner property is here to the east. Mm -hmm. so and then to both of and Sagamore is where yeah. Sagamore was not when we purchased this land. Sagamore was not even oh, there. I don't know. They hadn't begun that construction yet. Yeah. Okay. So that's all been developed since we acquired this property. And then, Trustee Hanson, if you head um, on that roadway, which is, would be uh, kind of a southwest okay. direction, the Kuffner subdivision okay. is at the end of that street there. So You're talking about the street here? Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. And it would be way down here, kind of like two blocks of block kind of down. Maybe Google map it. Can you do that on the fly? Uh, yeah. Or point it out on a map behind one of those maps. So is this where, um, what, what, what's right here? This is all Oshner right here? Yes. Okay, and then Sagamore is right here? No. no. Across the street. Oh, up here. Right oh. there. Oh, I see. 76 comes into this. It really corner. would help. Okay. Yeah. 76 right. dead ends there. It, it just took me a second to pull it yes. off. I have it on here. You want to share it? Uh, George yeah. Jr.? Oh, I would love, love to if I can plug it in. Right here in this corner. <laughs> Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, totally fine. Okay. Picture is worth a thousand awards. So yeah. See that. Mm -hmm. So um, while we're pulling this up, has there been any um, talk with with Remington Homes at all about incorporating this somehow into no. there? I did receive an offer on this property back in uh, 08 from mm -hmm. Superior. It's this piece of storage, but yeah. We visited with the town it. manager at that time, and mm -hmm. he was not in support of expanding mm -hmm. the self storage. So we just the contract. Uh, <clears throat> and I don't know if there's a way to. Uh, well, go ahead and yeah, so point out where it is. It's this piece right here. So you have Sag the Sagamore subdivision here, the Oxner piece, and then the Superior self storage, and then their properties right there. Is there a town water and sewer on that now? No. No, but it's right in the street. Yeah. Either on Maybe on the property, but yeah, all right. have access to it. Either on Cold Creek or right in here. Just uh, for edification purposes, how does far does water and sewer extend? Right off the street. Right here. I mean, we have water and sewer to this subdivision. But where does it end along Cold Creek? You know, there's, a, there's a manhole cover. Um, you want a pointer? Yeah, a pointer would be okay. here, just in case anybody's it's listening. Steep, right over there, pointer. <laughs> We're toying with you. <laughs> Push that front button. There's a manhole cover right about there. I understand, I've been told that the sewer line is about 30 feet down. So we would have a gravity flow to the sewer from the property. Mm -hmm. I know the city did whoever, that engineering. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, whoever develops it will install it. We'll have to absorb that cost. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about it? Or? Just the, the zoning on it was rezoned in 2000? No, it's it's in unincorporated Boulder County, so it's not in the town currently. Oh. The comprehensive plan, though, has it designated as residential. Oh. Okay. It's currently agricultural zoning. In Boulder County. Okay. Say again? In Boulder County, yes. yeah. It's a 
you know, so they, it's two point, almost 2.4 acres, but by the time you take the roadway out of it, it makes it a little less than two acres, 1.9. So, Steve, is your intent then to uh, put it up for sale? We don't know. Okay. We've often, or we, we've thought for a long time that we would build it out at some point. Okay. But I'm not sure that we'll do that. And uh, tell me what the advantages are to you of annexation versus staying in uh, unincorporated Boulder County. Um, obviously, this. <laughs> we need a look home now. <laughs> I'll talk louder. Um, advantages to you of annexation versus keeping it the same way it is now. What are those advantages? Well, I think it. You see, if you wouldn't mind it, yeah, no, just okay. the mic. Sorry. Uh, well, I think it's a benefit to, to the town to incorporate it into the town. Uh, it's a benefit to us also. I think it increases the value. Gives us more flexibility if we decide to do something. We can, you know, we have something to go to the bank with. Right now, we don't. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, time is passing here since 2000, so I'm not, you know, I'm in the, economy, the current economic condition, I'm not sure that now is the time to develop. I don't know that I have the wherewithal to develop it. I may have to bring in a partner. I may have to sell it. I may keep it. Uh, we thought this would be the first step to see what indeed what, I, what our options are. Other Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. So, Matt, um, what's the process to annex property, and then what would be some of the reasons why we wouldn't want to consider doing that? Um, well, um, well, actually, in this case, there's two possible options for the process for annexation. Since it's an enclave, which means it's surrounded on all sides by uh, property that's already in the town, I mean, the town could annex it in without the property owner's application, um, which we would initiate, the town would initiate. The other option is for the stewards to submit an application for annexation to the town. Um, and then typically what we ask for in when the property comes into town that they have a development plan submitted at the same time. Um, but they could just asked to be annexed in with and with a specific zoning request. So it would be annexed in zone with just a straight zoning. Okay. Similar to what you see in original town with some of the properties. But And isn't that what they're asking? Yes. Okay. I mean it sounds like it, yeah. Yes. Um, but so those are kind of the two options for as far as the process goes. And then it goes for staff review and the planning commission and the town board ultimately decides. And typically the town hasn't annexed properties without a development agreement. That's pretty clear cut. So I don't think we've annexed any property for just straight zoning ever, or at least not for a really long time. So um, that would be at least slightly problematic from my standpoint. So um, I mean, just, it, just as a comment, I think it makes sense for it to come to town. There's no reason to have a county property that's in the middle of a you know, residential area. I think it makes sense to have it come into the town. I think residential makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think it would be, might make the most sense to do this in coordination with Remington Homes or whoever is going to develop the Oxner property. Um, so I mean that's just a suggestion um, because otherwise I'd like to see some more concrete details before we just annex it. So. A development plan as a site. Mm -hmm. Which really consists of a plan. Um, yeah, I mean, Fred would you could remind me of the exact process, what that is in the step, but. Well, that might, that may be possible. I, I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what I would have to do to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, what I'd like to do is make this as, you know, relatively easy for everybody involved, make sure that it makes sense for everybody involved. I think we can come up with a win-win situation, but we want to make sure that we're doing things that are going to protect the town in the long term. Um, sure. And I'd like to see that, you know, without you having to spend a whole bunch of money up front and then say, you know, then the town say, no, we don't want that. You know, so hmm. I'd like to somehow to work with staff. I mean, I'm, I don't want to speak for the board, so if people don't want to see that happen, please chime in. But otherwise, I'd like to 
see you work with staff and come up with some reasonable solution about, you know, doing some schematics. This is kind of what it looks like without having to do a whole bunch of engineering. So we could see what that potentially would look like. Uh, because I, you know, generally, you know, I can't, I'm going to be, uh, be the attorney for the moment. Ah. I can't say we're going to ax you into town, right? Because that's going to go through the uh, public hearing. But in general, conceptually, it seems like it makes sense. At least from my perspective. Trustee Farrington. The, um, just to piggyback on that, um, it seems to make intuitive sense. However, I need to be educated on if it is brought in as zoned medium density, and some of the uses on medium density are, for example, uh, park and recreation areas and facilities, public schools, golf courses, family care homes, daycare homes, safe houses, and then utilities and household pets. I'm not sure if that means you can run a, what does that mean, utilities and household pets? But in, you can answer that in the context of the fact is, once something is at zoned medium density, um, how much control do we have over its ultimate use within medium density? Well, the household pets just means, I mean, it, it's basically stating you can't have like livestock in that type. Oh, okay. It's making that designation. Okay. Um, but if they have the straight zone, then they have a use by right. Um, so they would still need to come in with the develop site plan app application and make sure they meet all the setbacks and open space requirements. So there is some mm -hmm. process they still have to go through to make sure that use works for mm -hmm. that property. But, but um, if you want to see something specific or, or don't want to see something specific, we need to make sure we outline that before we annex. Well, let me, let me just use as an example. A safe house <laughs> can be allowed in medium density. So if that were the you might be able if we to, did the medium uh, density first and then somebody came in and wanted to do safe house and the right. community around there said no way we don't want a safe house you might be able to limit some of that through the an annexation agreement okay if the board would yes. <laughs> <laughs> come on up for okay so, so that would have to be yeah. prior limited before we approve the right. medium density designation Be annexed without um, rezoning it, and then can it come? Can they come back and have it rezoned with a, a plan development? Well, when it's annexed, it has to have an initial zoning. So it has an initial zoning now. But that's in Boulder County. Boulder County. It doesn't have a zoning under the town of Superior. And I think what, okay. what happened? And I don't remember. The, and it this. can't be annexed without any zoning. No. Well, I mean, if. What, ha what potentially was going to happen was it was going to be AUR, right. which basically means it's agriculture, right. which is basically a holding designation within the town so that you could zone it later on. But I don't think anybody wants to go through that process again. And, you know, I think right. that would make more sense to do that up front. Mm -hmm. Well, limitations in the, you know, the annexation agreement is fine. I don't have an issue with it if that's possible. Mm -hmm. Certainly is. Yep. So, once again, we're not approving anything tonight. We're not going to say if they're going to vote yes or no, but kind of general head nod that people want to see this process move forward or, or no. I think it makes sense. I think that um, I don't understand why it has never been annexed in, into uh, Superior all this time. I mean, it's just been brought to my attention well, over the last couple of weeks that there's a property within Superior, within the town, surrounded, that's unincorporated. Well, well the there's two things there. One, it, for an annexation typically to occur, the property owner has to come forward and request that. Uh, okay. And it wasn't surrounded on all three sides until recently when that's the Ox, Oxner piece came into town. So in that, in that just Reason happened. that's a few years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, to me, I think we should move forward in whatever way we need to move forward in. Okay. So uh, I guess what it, once again, what I'd recommend is to work with staff to come up with some, you know, 
I don't know what the right terminology would be, but once again, some sort of sketches to kind of outline how this might look on the property. Once again, to kind of get a general, more kind of general head nod before you spend a whole bunch of engineering money to do to do additional work. That's what I would would recommend. And once again, it might make most sense, especially since Oxner, I think, is looking for some. The town is looking from Oxner for some transportation improvement in the what would be your northeast corner, and so it probably would make the most sense to somehow coordinate that process. So, okay. does that sound fair to everybody? Public comment? Uh, yeah, you can yeah. if you like. It's a work session, but Thank you. sure. Thanks. Can I be now? Sure. A lot of support for 404 South Third Avenue. Um, this states that uh, it is in original town. Within original town, there's a comprehensive plan, which has been um, mentioned. Uh, there's the land use code. Uh, I think these people need to be made aware that there are some uh, issues with this uh, project that um, is going to meet very strong public criticism and opinions. Um, one of those uh, is the view. Now, uh, we have discussed the view extensively with uh, the Oshner property. Uh, we discussed it extensively with the Sanguar uh, development. Um, there, if there's going to be 12 to 14 units on that small piece of uh, property, there's going to be massive traffic problems. I don't think these people are aware of all the times that we've been at the meetings regarding traffic issues when it comes to development in that area. And that's going to be a massive, massive concern. And I'm going to tell you that I want a major traffic study done. And they need to know that. They may not want to spend that money, but that, that needs to be pointed out to them. The other thing is the grid. We have hashed and discussed and hashed and discussed the grid for years. And you know that, Mr. Mayor. That property does not meet original town grid, and you cannot build on it to meet that grid. And they also need to know that because I don't think that they're aware of all the problems that um, is going to come up. And I want this public comment because of the fact staff doesn't seem to tell developers these three main issues that are with other residents within the area regarding anything to be developed. All right, anything else to wrap this up? Yeah, I got something to say. Okay. Work session. Yeah, typically. So, once again, just as a work uh, session, it's usually for the town board. Here. But. Our zoning map used to be a different color. Our, our uh, being residential used to be red. I don't know. Every time we seem like we get a consultant, we get in different colors on our map. This kind of corresponds with that, but the original map is not like this here. I don't know when this map was done. Do you know, Mayor? Uh, well, it looks like 2010, but I don't. It's just my guess. But. Residential used to be yellow, and a medium residential was red, and I think that uh, which was medium residential, uh, residential was uh, a different color, and I think that you ought to get that up to date of how much medium residential we have and how much residential we have already. I'm, I'm just saying, that in my mind, that maps are not corresponding with prior maps. Okay. I don't know. Phyllis, when is that map put up up there? I think the one we had up there, it has been changed. 2008. 2008. When? 8, 2008. See, they took the old ones down and they get different colors. So let's get them back up to date one way or the other. That's just like our town map. we got so many different maps over we don't know which map we're using anymore. Thanks. Okay. Sort of along these lines, it also might make sense, and I, I, I'm not sure if, uh, where town staff is with this, but we have talked about an update with the comprehensive plan, not necessarily regarding the colors, but uh, how this property might fit in, because I th um, that might be you know good to see what that 
how the comprehensive plan looked at your property and then before you did a lot, whole bunch of work on it and then make sure that everybody was in the same sort of uh, same idea about it. So just a thought. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. So move on to the next agenda item. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, our second item for the work session is a presentation by um, downtown Colorado. Um, Catherine Corral is here to uh, give a presentation to the board. Catherine is with downtown Colorado, who's also associated with the Colorado Municipal League. They do uh, a lot of work for municipalities and helping them uh, either revitalize their downtowns or just um, um, their main streets and coming up with um, different ways to make improvements to those and we've been working with her over last month I guess yeah and the ec economic development council and we thought it'd be good for her to come down and um, give a presentation to the board give the board some background on on her organization what she's going to be doing for us and uh, trustee Hanson been working closely with her as well and um, may have some additional input as well great thanks welcome thanks for coming thank you so much and thank you for having me here um, I, uh, we were here before, and we have been working over the past couple months to kind of put together a plan for you. Um, so tonight I'll just give you a little bit of an overview of what we do um, and the process that we're developing here to, to work with Superior. Um, as you can see, we work on community-driven asset-based economic development. So that's a lot of, a lot of words in, in that little statement. But I think that the key things to keep in mind are the ideas of community, connections, communications, and conserving resources. Um, so to start with, we are a nonprofit membership organization, and um, while we do partner with Colorado Municipal League, and we, you know, we have some agreements with them, we're not, you know, we're a completely separate organization, just to be clear. But our focus is helping communities to bring their commercial districts and their business districts or their main streets um, to, to help them be more vibrant and, and keep the life or, or bring back life, revitalize or keep vital those places that are the gathering places for your community. So we do that through a number of different ways. Primarily, we are a membership and an advocacy organization. We do not lobby, but we do work with different communities and different interests around the, the small businesses and the connections to the neighborhoods, the residents, the, the universities, the libraries, the museums, all of those things, and, and look at how to support those connections throughout our state. So we do take positions, though we do not lobby. We share information with our members. And um, as a member of the Town of Superior, you are all welcome to call us if you have questions, if there's additional information you'd like, or if um, you see something you know, coming up in the legislature at the state that you'd like to find out more about. We're always available and fielding those types of questions from our membership base. We also have a series of educational offerings. So we have these on a monthly, quarterly, and annual basis. Um, next week, we actually have our monthly session, which is going to be looking at business improvement districts and the role of events and diversifying funding. And that brings up one of the, one of the groups we work with are different groups that organize um, management structures for commercial districts. So sometimes that's a business improvement district, sometimes that's a merchants association, sometimes that's a downtown development authority or an urban renewal authority. It really depends on what the objectives are for the district. Um, and that's going to be on Wednesday. Then on Thursday and Friday we have something in Minter that's focused more on smaller communities and that's looking at how you actually promote your commercial district. So how do you get the word out give that message to people about, you know, what is your identity and how do you bring people in, as well as how do you connect with your own local residents. And we have on-site technical assistance is what we're kind of working with you on, um, and, and looking at panel discussions or training, downtown assessments. And um, I have been working quite closely with Trustee Hansen and putting together some ideas based on um, where you guys have been and where you'd like to go and, and putting together um, a menu of different things that we can do to sort of take you from point A to point B. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. 
And then we have different programs that we offer. So we have, as I mentioned, development and improvement district programs. So those are working with anything from your nonprofits to your quasi-governmental organizations, um, as well as the Main Street program, which I'll talk a little bit more uh, about in a moment. So what I'd like to do tonight is just review the concept of, of district revitalization as a community engagement tool. So really a way to bring together the community and hear from the different interests that are out there. Um, understanding the processes and structure uh, behind the commercial district revitalization and how you can form committees so that you can get your active citizens involved in actually implementing and working to improve the quality of life in your community. Um, and also looking at different tools that are available to you and, and some of the ones that we've recommended that we start with um, in the process here. Um, and then thinking about next steps. So the idea behind what we do is focusing on the commercial core is really, it's the center of the community. It's, it's gathering places. It's traditionally where people come to find out information or to shop or to um, do something fun. Um, and your community is a little less, tri than, less traditional than your typical Main Street downtown, but we're looking at the, the Marketplace Center and, and thinking about all of the different interests there. So how is it connecting to your historic park, or how is it connecting to original town, or how is it connecting to the different housing developments that you have nearby, or is it not connecting? and thinking about where can those connections be made so that it can be a more vital and more vibrant piece of your community. Um, and the way we look at doing this is really by fostering public-private partnerships. So everyone knows that the economy you know, is, is tight and it's challenging times and, and there probably aren't huge more resources coming to town. So when you think about what resources you have, how do you really tap into them so that you can work towards unified goals? And the reason I like this graphic here is because it shows the crossover between your local government or your public sector, your chamber, your different tourism groups, your libraries, your museums, and the things that they're promoting, and then your economic development ideas for you know attracting or retaining businesses, filling up the, the vacant storefronts that you might have, and looking at the, you know, the fact that all of these things need to be working together towards unified community goals and helping you get to that point where you can move forward. And the basis on which we work is it comes from the National Trust for Historic Preservation Main Street Center. And in the 80s, they created this idea of the Main Street concept, which looks at these four things, economic restructuring, design, promotion, and organization. And the idea is that if you can keep those centers vital, then you're actually going to conserve resources because you're not going to be tearing down those buildings, building something new, um, but you'll really be able to, to figure out how to activate, especially the smaller storefronts that you have, so that you can get some smaller, local, hopefully independent retailers to come in and sort of engage um, the community that way as well. But the key here is the engagement piece in the center. So the idea behind those four points is that if you have the community engagement, then you can kind of build up so that you can keep all of these balls in the air. So you can think about how are we doing fundraising? How are we incorporating volunteers and active citizens that want to have their voice heard and want to, to give time to our efforts? How do we develop those partnerships? But also, how do we create the image for our community that we'd like to share with our locals, with tourists, with you know, the rest of the state? And, um, and more. And then thinking about with economic development, your retention, your uh, attraction of businesses, streamlining processes so that if you have um, property owners or business owners who would like to invest and grow their business or enhance their property, that it's not a challenge for them to do so. Um, and then thinking about your market analysis. So do you actually understand the market that you're working in and, and is, are there ways that you can really enhance that even more? as well as design, which is all of the physical attributes. So that might be anything from streetscape, oops, um, streetscape, signage, planning, zoning, um, historic preservation may not be as applicable, but parking, infrastructure types of, of items as well. And then 
I just created this because I think that it sort of shows how once you start building on these, say sustainability is the objective that you take initially, and then you can kind of grow. So it's not a process that stops. Once you, you really put this process in place, it allows you to have um, an institution of community engagement and the public-private partnership that allows you to continue selecting new goals and moving forward in that way. So when we talk about asset-based land use, it's really looking at your usage patterns, missing teeth, which I used to explain those empty storefronts, or things that sort of inhibit people from continuing their walk along your district where they might be spending money, um, and thinking about the market potential and revenue generation that you have available that you're not meeting. So if you have this Main Street Four Point approach, this kind of adds in the real estate redevelopment aspect. So if you have pieces of real estate that are inactive and are not generating revenue, how do you really think about how to make them start working for you as an asset as opposed to a liability? This is an example of, of how that works. And this is a historic building. But um, the idea is just that by providing this type of drawing, you can say, OK, if this building were active, this is the amount of square feet that would be on the market, potentially generating revenue. And this can be used both to work with property owners, or it could be given to property owners to work with developers or to seek investment money and that sort of thing. Um, and then this is the idea of connecting usage patterns. This is a community that we were working with. And um, so we looked at what they were looking at this, and how could they redevelop this long strip of road to make it more of a community gathering place? And they had a rec center over here. You can't really see the writing, but there's a rec center over on the far right. And then there was their events pavilion where people were gathering. And then there's their transit center. So when you look at the way the community, the locals, use this land, you see that this smaller strip is actually where enhancements would pay off. So when you think about a bigger bang for your buck, it's right here. So by investing in that, instead of that, you're able to tap into where the community is using it. And then you look at, along this road, what, what can you do to fill in the holes around these buildings? Because this was all empty, you know, parking lots and, and, and that sort of thing. So those things were not being utilized at all. So that's just kind of a couple examples of how the concepts work. Um, and it can really be applied to any community. Now, um, some of the tools that we use to do this, this is an example of a stakeholder analysis. And this is kind of where we're going here. We've been working to do some surveys, get a list of different stakeholders here in Superior, um, looking at surveys to gather information from different groups here, um, talk about some individual interviews with some of your uh, bigger uh, property owners and the bigger uh, retailers that are here to sort of figure out what is their objective here and how, you know, how can you really get everybody sort of on the same page. Um, so that one, you don't lose anyone, and two, you can really sort of put together objectives that will meet everybody's needs. Um, and that will require a little bit of research because you do have some corporations that might, um, you know, not not actually be at the table, but you can we can study what they what they support on a policy level, um, and then taking it and kind of looking at from there how can we harness what you have going on in the community? So thinking about the different skills that maybe the town staff needs or um, that the process needs to move forward and helping to, to find the people who are so dedicated in your community who'd like to spend their time working to enhance the community as a whole. And then the last piece is the communication strategy. And this is really thinking about which tools are going to do which type of outreach and what's the message that needs to go to each different um, group. So those are some tools that are out there. Um, I think the, the ideal end to this, in my mind, would be to have an assessment of your commercial center. And that's the um, type of technical assistance. I included information in all of your packets about technical assistance. But the downtown assessment 
really allows us to bring in specialists. As I said, we have members, and the majority of our members are local governments. But about 40% of our membership is private sector consultants, and they volunteer their time for us. So we can bring in different consultants, whether they be you know, land use planners, or they be developers, or they you know, work with um, whatever types of groups. So as we move forward and you determine what sort of skills you'd like to see, we can bring in different people who volunteer their time for us, and we coordinate the team to put together a plan looking at those four points that really gives you kind of a to-do list. And this is just a sample. This is not directed at, at anyone here. But what we do with this is we actually assign tasks to different groups. And this is what communities use to really get together this committee structure and activate the community. So the first step is the stakeholders analysis to understand who's involved, what are their interests, how supportive are they, how do you communicate with them. And then the next step might be to do an assessment so that you have a hands-on plan for moving forward over the next you know, three to five years or so, depending on how fast you go. So um, these are the objectives that we discussed with um, Trustee Pennington and Hanson, as well as Matt and Beth. And um, really thinking about collecting and analyzing the different studies that you have. I know most communities have different studies and surveys and have you know, sort of taken on different pieces of the puzzle through time. And many of them end up having um, studies that kind of sit on the shelf. So what we'd like to do is incorporate all of that in, because most of the consultants provide you with good material. It's just about getting from it being on the shelf to it happening. So that's one piece of what we'd like to do. And then working with the stakeholders, whether that be through individual meetings or researching or the surveys and, and different focus groups that um, might be a part of that process. And then thinking about a plan for communication. So with each one of those stakeholders groups, what's going to be the easiest way to communicate with them so that they understand and that we're all coming to yes, so that we can all sort of select our objectives and figure out how to work towards those as a group. Um, and then, you know, if you go forward with the downtown assessment, it would move on to forming those stakeholder groups and those committees to actually activate your citizens, your partner organizations, and your town to work together in a unified and synchronized fashion for downtown revitalization. And that is my contact information. <laughs> Great, thank you. Very, yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Questions? Anybody would like to start? Just Hanson, do you want to describe how things have been going from your perspective? Um, Well, our first, uh, the first objective of getting a survey together is finally complete. So the next step for us as a group in the EDRC is to meet, review that, and then roll out the, the survey to the businesses. Um, I, uh, you know, I want to move things on a little quicker because uh, I want to get more information on local businesses and what it takes you know, to help them out and uh, create some kind of an attraction strategy. And just a, a question, I think that you said this, though, that you're concentrating on the superior marketplace. Is that true, or is it more wide-reaching? Well, I think that was the idea, to look at that and look at how to possibly fill up some of the smaller storefronts there. But the whole, the whole concept of what we do is really how to connect it with the larger community. Mm -hmm. So it is wider-reaching, um, though... My understanding is that's where we'd like to sort of have the center, like the central core piece, and then sort of tie in all the other areas to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And was, okay. Yeah, thank you. So that, that's the, the primary objective, is to understand the marketplace a little bit better. But we're also going to survey other businesses throughout Superior and uh, just understand them a little bit better as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just if I can add. Yes, please. I think the... Con the concept, I don't know if I fleshed it out as much as I normally do, but the concept is that if you pick a center and, and you really focus on getting that piece vital, just like the heart in your body pumps blood to the rest of it, that would you know help to spread the vibrancy to the rest of the community. So it would also foster you know, engagement and activity in other areas as well. So a question to the staff. So I see Central still has the, their 
real estate signs up there, has that transaction occurred where the Centro is no longer the property owner there? It has occurred, actually. Um, and we are meeting with um, Paul Shepard, who uh, was the leasing agent for the marketplace for Centro next week, just to kind of discuss with him how, what's the next step since that transaction is closed. So mm -hmm. we'll have more information for the board next week. And is there going to be a different property manager? That's there? what we're, we intend to find out next week when we meet with them. Because they'll have more information than um, trying to contact somebody at Blackstone. Think, so. Yeah. Because I would imagine that uh, having a con having an understanding of what the new property owner over there would like to see is going to be an important first step because nothing is going to happen in the severe marketplace without their agreement since there's one property owner except for the big boxes. Right. Uh, and so probably engaging them somehow mm -hmm. to identify if they see a problem, what they identify, what the problem is, and how do you solve that problem. So, um, and once again, I think it's be good to engage the, the new new group, Sandy. Right. Um, if we can, if I can um, try to put this in, in perspective how we got to this point, uh, EDRC has met numerous times, and one of the short-term goals they identified as residents of the community, and it's just a working group, it makes no uh, um, claims to represent the entire community. Um, one of the identified needs is to figure out what this community wants to see for Superior Marketplace. So yes, we go to the developer and we ask, what is your intent towards this? How much money are you willing to put into it? How satisfied are you? But this whole process is to say, what do we as a community, what do the business owners who currently uh, lease space or own space there, what do they want to see? so that we actually hopefully can, can have a dialogue with the developer and put things out there that we'd like to see and hopefully thereby collaborate um, to, to help help it happen. You know, if, if all we say is what are you willing to do, mm -hmm. half the dialogue is really missing. Right, so it'd be, so that presupposes that we've identified, and you know, I think everybody has sort of a gut reaction, but we've identified that there's a problem there. Right. And what the problem is, is it just because doors aren't filled or is it there's actually the real estate, the infrastructure there? Is well, that's incorrect. actually the stakeholder process is asking people what their perceptions are. And one outcome may be there is no problem. You know, we can't go into it. Uh, maybe I misspoke a little bit uh, saying there is a problem. Uh, it's, it's to identify whether or not mm -hmm. on net people think there is a problem. And if they do, what they think that problem is, and then to gather ideas on what to do about it. So mm -hmm. it actually starts at the beginning to see whether or not the perception is there is a problem. Okay. And it doesn't always have to be a problem as much as what would you like to see. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to you know, come yeah. from the negative as in you know, we hate this or we hate that. But how do you enhance a positive to find this? You know, that's another, you know, so it's, it's, it's what, what is the potential mm -hmm. and how can you get from where you are to where you'd like to be as a community? And the developer is a part of your community now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, bringing in all those pieces. So uh, also another thought is that I think that we've envisioned that our downtown will be in the, across the way over in the town center. And so would be there would be some discussion about, well, th this is what has not worked well in other communities that have tried to do this, such as, uh, you know, I forget what they, is it Belmar? I, I don't yeah, know what these places are, but, you know, what what didn't work well there, what do we want to avoid, that kind of thing. So would that be a part of the discussion as well? I think that would come out more in a downtown assessment because right now we're just looking at stakeholders so kind of assessing what what different people would like to see, mm -hmm. what people you know appreciate or don't appreciate about what currently exists, um, that sort of thing. But if we were to do a downtown assessment, um, that that would definitely be something that can be incorporated. Now we could also gear some of the questions that we're asking through the stakeholder analysis to that issue, mm -hmm. if that's if that's something that you'd like incorporated here. Mm -hmm. At least from my perspective, I want to 
uh, have as much learning about the bad things that happen to other places and not uh, duplicate that here. So, you know, whatever we can do to glean any information that you might have from from your organization's history associated with these places, I think would be very helpful for the town. Absolutely, and I actually have board members who were involved in putting together Belmar, so I can I can build that in for sure. <laughs> right. Other thoughts or comments? Okay. So what's the next step, I guess? Mm -hmm. What are the next steps here? Um, well, our next step is to meet on Wednesday uh, and review the survey and then uh, finalize the rollout of the survey. How we're going to approach businesses, um, who's going to divide that up, and then we'll start rolling out the survey. And then once the survey is complete, we'll give those results to Catherine, and then uh, we'll get the uh, EDRC back together and we'll review and, and create an action plan. And we'd like to incorporate all of those things when we start doing the interviews with the different stakeholders. So we wanted to hear first from the businesses and then mm -hmm. go forward from there. Okay. All right. Anything else? Mr. Magley, did you have anything else about this topic that you wanted to share? Or? No. How much staff time is how how is that being divvied up? Are you uh, is uh, there a point person that's well? It's a, a team effort between myself and Beth, our assistant manager, okay. you know, so, and Justin Hans has been doing quite a bit of work on it. So between us, um, it's uh, manageable workload. And I see. Some representation from the chamber. Um, is the chamber involved in this process at all? <laughs> I'm seeing an affirmative head nod. <laughs> okay. Thanks. All right. Well, it looks like we have some time, so thank you very much, and we'll take a five minute break then before the town board meeting. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you.
Welcome, everybody. I'd like to call to order a regular meeting of the Town of Superior Board of Trustees for July 11, 2011. And Phyllis, if you call the roll. Excuse okay. me. Mayor Ann Buckle? Here, I think. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Ilya Gagoras? Here. Trustees Joe Cirelli, Chris Hansen? Here. Sandy Pennington? Here. Lisa Skumatz, Deborah Williams? Here. Town Manager Matt Magley? Here. Town Attorney Kendra Carberry? Here. Town Clerk Phil Sutton? Great, thanks. That brings us to item number two, approval agenda. Are there any changes to tonight's agenda? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion by Trustee Gregoras, second by Trustee Williams. Wow, sorry. Um, to approve the agenda, all in favor? Unanimous, thank you. That brings us to item number four, reports, questions, and issues. And who would like to start tonight? Trustee Pennington? Mine's a... Um going to be very quick when the book drops operational and Matt during yours you might give a state of the book drop yeah, there sure. but it is operational yeah. and then I did want to raise the issue again um, on the annuals um, mm -hmm. um, I'm passing quite a number of beds that look under stress the ones nearer my house actually seem to have been replanted yeah but uh, a bunch of them seem to be under stress. There's a couple of things. We've had rabbit issues, uh, but also Cocal will go back in and, and replace them, mm -hmm. um, those beds that we identify. So you'll see some of that as well. Um, the beds we identify, are they actively out there Both. looking themselves? Both, huh? I would, um, Rock Creek Circle, okay. um, on the uh, east side of, on the west side of, uh, is it Summit Apartments? Mm -hmm. um, those beds are looking particularly bad as I came home today. But um, I would say um, there are numerous, and I'd sort of like them actively to, yeah, and, and to be going out looking they at are, them. Yeah. Okay. So you may see a delay from when they identify them and when they get to them. Okay. Yeah. That's all. Trustee Kikros. Uh, yeah, welcome to the Seattle City Council. <laughs> I've never seen more rain back to back to back. Um, but I wanted to let you know, I was going to call you this morning, Matt, but um, there's a big aspen tree that got blown down uh, yeah. yesterday on Pitkin and like near River Bend. Yeah, um, we had that windstorm. Yeah. And uh, um, our parks recreation staff's been going through today. And uh, along with Cocal and okay. getting to the areas that need to be um, trees that are damaged need to be trimmed. And no, this one is all the way down. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, slowly but surely they'll get to. I know our, our neighbors next to us I just had their trampoline literally picked up mm -hmm. and then slammed to the ground again. Just got demolished. So I don't know what happened. <laughs> it was like 10, 15 minutes of unbelievable weather. Mm -hmm. And we're going to open up the. Uh, tree the yard waste site isn't usually open until Wednesday. We're going to open that up tomorrow. So okay, that may be good. Wednesday There's a lot of debris. Yeah. And Matt, you're going to put that over the e blast to notify residents. Uh, you know, Martin and I didn't talk that far, but it, we'll get the word out. Okay. Uh, and we also had a meeting uh, this week with uh, Kevin and. Heather and uh, myself and Matt and a couple of other people, the owners of Chick-fil-A, just to discuss options about it, forming a, finding a place for a community center for the town of Superior. I think it was very well, a lot of good ideas, and we'll keep moving forward in that direction. I'm uh, very hopeful that we will finally get a community center in this town. So thanks to Kevin. Okay. Trustee Williams? Well, uh, somehow I must have missed this uh, huge storm that happened yesterday because uh, well, we went climbing a 14, 14er and we came back and uh, I saw a lot of trees down and a lot of crazy stuff. So, um, sorry I missed that great storm. Uh, we actually had three storms yesterday. They came and went, cleared up, okay. came and went again, cleared up again. It was a very strange phenomenon, I think. Well, the mountains were pretty clear until like 2 o'clock, but... Um, I am going to be out of town the next week, and there is an open space advisory committee meeting this third or Wednesday from seven to nine. I'm wondering if the 
there's anyone here that can take my place. I may be able to meet the next one, so at least an hour of that. All right. Starts at 7 here? Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to give uh, huge kudos to the staff and all the volunteers, everybody involved for July 4th. Uh, oh. Pancake uh, breakfast, the parade, and the downhill mile. Um, thank you very much for all that. It was a great time. Also, uh, we had a Louisville City uh, dinner meeting with our board and their council. And uh, we kind of um, discussed how we could work together in the future as far as uh, whether it's sharing services or any other uh, ways that we can work together, which we already are working together, which is the, our library. Um, and then I attended a Dr. Cog, which is Denver Regional Council of Governments, and it's a Metro Vision Implementation Task Force. And it's kind of an overarching group that is kind of tasked with um, so, sort of part of the board retreat that we had done, um, their major Metro Vision goals. So we are going to be kind of figuring out who will be on the steering committee, which is also kind of an advisory group. Then there's, underneath that, there's what they call a champion team, where there's, that will lead, um, these people will lead special project teams. And uh, you never know, I might be volunteering somebody, maybe from the audience, um, to be on maybe the champion team. Um, but uh, stay tuned for that, and I'll let you know more about it when I get further into it. Great. Thanks. Um, I don't think I have anything to report. Uh, we had, a, I thought, a very productive meeting with Louisville. Not that we accomplished any, anything in particular, but building bridges, I think, was very helpful with uh, our neighboring community. So I thought that was nice. Um, there is an upcoming meeting with the uh, governor's um, uh, working group with the Jefferson Parkway at the end of the month that I can't get to, but staff, I think, has volunteered to, to meet. And um, the CDOT director should be presenting some information. I'm not sure, you know, it's kind of short turnaround, so I'm not, I don't know how much information is actually going to be available at that time. Uh, there's a traffic consultant who's going to be looking at traffic projections. Um, and that turnaround seems to be quite fast. So once again, I'm not sure exactly how much information is going to be available for that. But When is that meeting? Uh, 27th, if I remember off the top of my head. And I'm available if so I'm, we would like an elected official there from our town. Yeah, I think that might be helpful. That's all I have. Just Hanson. Yep. I have also attended the Louisville City Council dinner meeting, and uh, it was just nice to break bread with them. I've never met them or interacted, so it was really nice to be there. And I also appreciated the uh, good uh, possible collaboration opportunities with them. Um, again, the uh, Fourth of July parade and pancake breakfast was phenomenal. Thank you to everybody who came out, and congratulations to this year's float winners. And then, of course, thank you to the staff and all the details for putting on another great event. It was really good. Great. I think from the town clerk. Yep. Town manager. Uh, yeah. Let's see. So, as was mentioned earlier, um, Blackstone has closed on um, purchasing a properties from Centro, so we're going to be meeting with um, the leasing agent, and I'm not sure, I, I believe he's still with Centro, but next week to try to figure out, you know, who is going to be taking over the management of the property and the leasing for the marketplace, and just get all that information and see if we can get that relationship going with the new owner, so um, we'll be working on that next week. Um, it's Phil's birthday. Hey, happy uh, birthday. Yeah. <laughs> happy birthday <laughs> to you. <laughs> happy birthday <laughs> to you. <laughs> happy birthday, dear <laughs> Phyllis. <laughs> happy birthday <laughs> to you. <laughs> uh, you didn't know I was going to do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Uh, <laughs> 
No, we don't go that far. We sent everybody the information about Wahoo Tacos. And they've already got a lease. Oh. Seriously, already? Yeah, yeah. already. Of well, course. probably they knew that this they know was front. It's out at 120th and Sheridan. So. Oh, but that doesn't mean, I mean, that's pretty far away from this area, so mm -hmm. we'll still pursue. Yeah, would pursue. they like to have a second right, yeah. store for it? Hmm. Um, and then um, I learned today, I talked to Chris Barnes with Resolute uh, Development. Taco Bell, we let them know that this property wasn't going to work. Um, and they've been re talking to Taco, uh, Resolute about a pad there on their property. And now they're looking at the site right next to Chick-fil-A, it sounds like, in Broomfield. So I've been working with Resolute today on, you know, maybe there's some ways we can encourage them to come back our way. So I'll let you know more as, as we talk. Just to give you a heads up. Um, It'll be drive through central there. Yes, it will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Chris Barnes, he, he felt there was something they could do on their end as well. So, yeah. we'll see. Okay. Uh, I think that was it. Okay. Anything from the town attorney and then come back to... No, thank you. Trustee Gregoris? Yeah, okay. I had a couple of questions, actually. Um, I was asked if you know when the uh, bleachers will go up at Williamsville. Um, What's the status of So those have been ordered, but there's a uh, window for delivery, so I'll... I'll follow up with the board and the digest when we expect those. Okay. Great. And then there's a young man that's actually ready to do his Eagle Scout project and he wanted to know if the town has any needs or any ideas of he can do he's willing to mm. come down and talk and yeah. garner some support from other young men. Can I give you an idea? Sure. Are you looking for specific ideas? Well, I'm not Larry? looking at anything. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, Larry here, and we spoke of uh, in the historical commission about possibly having some eagle help with the um, veterans memorial. Okay. Concept. So, uh, Martin Toth, I think, would be a contact mm -hmm. person yeah, on that. Okay. Uh, or uh, Patrick. Yeah. Oh, we'll start with Martin. I was okay. Saying. And then, but yeah, if he wants to come down too, we can talk to him. And you know, I can check. He's very open to anything. I mean, he doesn't mm -hmm. so like to help this down somehow so great there's actually somebody celebrating their eagle scout uh this evening that i couldn't get to uh martin benz i believe is martin benz, so, yeah. yeah well he's the one that helped with uh yeah did a great part. great yeah. job and he's celebrating his eagle scout nomination yeah. tonight so i tried That's to get great. to those but obviously couldn't make it this evening okay. so. great okay. thanks uh anything else that brings us to item number five, public comment on consent agenda and non-agenda items. Did you miss Chris? No, we won't. No. I don't think so, but hopefully I do. Excuse me, Gladys, 4444 South 3rd Avenue. Um, the CAC was created by a resident for resident communication. Communication has always been a problem in this town. Bruce screwed the residents uh, and took control of that rather than letting the com uh, residents uh, control it as it was organized to be done. The name has been changed a couple of different times. Uh, and now we have, I understand that this is the 21st century, but now you can't even go in and send just an email without having to go back in and do something else again. And I'm wanting to know why we keep having all these changes when it can't be just left as a very simple communication contact as it was originally organized to be. I, I know nothing about this. Yeah. Is there something that's changed? I, town, I don't know. Well, yeah, town staff have something to... message that you want to um, uh, put on the CAC side, then you have to go back in and you have to okay it. I mean, this is getting just a little bit ridiculous to... Uh, so, wait, let me ask you a question. So are you talking about when you send an email out to the CAC? 
or when you are in the CAC website making changes to your account? I'm going to send you an email. Right. Okay. I type my email. Before that email goes out to you, it has to come back for me to approve it to make sure that I want to go, to, that I want to send it. Okay. Then you need to go to your account and change that because I don't have that. I, I email Jay and say, you know, I, last week I got an email that I was deleted from the account. So okay, I did. I got that same thing. Then I reconnected, and now I'm able to send whenever I want to send without having to say yes. I want to send that. So would it be okay if there's? I mean, we could talk about all the technical issues tonight and try to hash it out. But maybe it would make just more sense to sit down with town staff to figure out if there's mm -hmm. something Jay. that happened that you need to do. Jay Is that be, fair? Jay would Unless there's perfect. some big policy issue that we need to talk about tonight that so we're aware of. Tomorrow, there's spam okay. issues with CAC. Okay. So that would go away Okay. So if I want to send an email and chew on you, then yeah. I can. Yeah. You, you can do it directly now. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, you know, like I say, this town has communication problems, and, and uh, this was organized for residents originally, and it, it, it just seems like there's changes all the time by staff, and I just don't think that's right. Can, can um, I ask a question? Can I ask a question on this? The CAC was everyone kicked off of it? Just certain people? Yeah, was it? So <laughs> I'm sorry. So now that we're having a discussion, I need to have. Uh, the, he the affirmative, the affirmative head yes. nod yes. in the audience. Problems. Jay Wolforth, town staff. Thank you. So there were spam issues on the CAC. The company tried to fix it. By doing that, they kicked people off by accident, and they have this message where you have to hit OK to say, are you really sure you want to send the message? I haven't fixed all that to go back the way it was. So it was just a little mishap. Okay. So, so uh, all these people that have been kicked off, are they going to be able to get back? I on? logged them back in. Oh, you did? Yes. Oh, okay. There's no conspiracy or anything. No, there's no conspiracy. I saw what Deborah got kicked off by accident. So. And I'm glad I'm a good company. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. Right, so, thanks. Sounds like thanks. that's best. Rubble rousers. <laughs> that's all right. Um, I just wanted to make um, a comment about um, the um, uh, June 27th minutes. Um, that uh, regarding the comment that was uh, in there about Oshners, um, you had asked uh, if it was pertaining to the other issues with this, and, and Matt said that it was pertaining to the pipes. Uh, Oshner and, and the town have to get permits from the state of Colorado to do their pipe work. They have not obtained those permits yet. And uh, that is as of this afternoon. Um, is the door sign going to be, uh, I had asked last time about a door sign being put up in the lobby, is that going to be pursued? Um, honestly, I hadn't thought about it okay. since then. <laughs> so. Okay. Then if it's not going to be put up, then something needs to be done about the microphones because it's very difficult uh, to hear if there's people in that uh, lobby uh, talking. Um, and so our tree branches in Ridgeville Town will be picked up tomorrow? Um, the, yeah. So uh, Cocal's going through town, finding those branches and, and picking them up. There's, there's quite a few on the ground, so. Okay. I don't know about tomorrow, but. Well, because I, I have them out by my gate. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. <coughs> Yeah, I just want to say something to what Gladys said about the sign, the door. Sometimes we have uh, issues that come up that, you know, bring a lot of residents into this room. And when that issue is resolved or talked about, and, you know, we have a massive exodus here, and, they, and it's true, they go out there and they're pretty loud. Is it possible when that happens, when we have an excessive number of people here, to make an announcement, say, okay, I, we realize that your issue is over with, but do you mind not congregating outside of this door, but just going outside and having your conversation. That way we don't, we're not interrupted that way, because I agree with you, Gladys. The, the, sometimes when we have five, ten people out there talking, it's, it, I can hear all of them, basically. So can we make an announcement, even as they're exiting, please take your conversations outside? I'm sure that we could work something out, yep. Okay. Hey, board, George Cutter, 109 South Fourth. Uh, back in the, on page 8, June the 22nd, this year we talked about uh, 
which could be put in the town nine over here, and I'm very unhappy with it. Says here, if you read that, uh, at the amphitheater on the original list did not garner a support, so it was removed, as well as game quality baseball. Come on, Mayor. We had a ballpark over here. We had a mound. We had bases. We George, had... you're, you're preaching to the choir with me, so you don't... <laughs> okay, I'm just letting this board know that I wanted to find some place other than where they're going to put it up on that corner. We're going to have a conflict of a ball little bully trying to practice, and then you're telling them they can't have scheduled games. It's wrong. Mm -hmm. If I practice kids, go back into it after 17 years, I expect ball games. Not at midnight or at 8 o'clock. I'm not asking for lights, but I'm asking for scheduled ball games. I'm asking for a field that will supply this. I'm getting tired of getting pushed aside about it. I want something done. So Please. Just, just in terms of process, this is going to be coming back to the board. I'm, it's being discussed in ProStack. Right. They're hashing this out. Let's have it's a separate, come. man. Let's get it done. So I've been it, down here time and time and time again. I'm, Getting tired of it. Let's have so, the board do something about it. So it's coming back to the board. There will be a robust discussion about that particular issue. I am certain. So that that time is not lost yet. What we have been trying to do is not to piecemeal this. I believe was the term that we was used last time, and so that we can have a coordinated uh, development in the town nine um, park area. So not to worry, George. I don't know if it's going to come to fruition, but I, I think that there's significant support within the community for something like that. So. And I think there's support within the board members. I suspect so, too. There's support within the board members to have a baseball field, so, you know. Um. George, I think we have to recognize the physical limitations of Town 9, and, and that's what's been done thus far, is can we safely have a competitive quality Ball field in town nine, and I, I think, and I have to agree with them. Having uh, been party to a lot of baseball teams, it, it doesn't have a large enough size uh, available for that to safely play, particularly next to all those houses, and particularly next to the central playground. You know, if you hit a ball, you could really injure. Uh, um, a child or, or somebody who's inattentive, but I do know ProStack has this well in hand, and maybe we need to schedule uh, some presentations sooner rather than later about what's being considered at ProStack. Mike, once again, watching a whole bunch of youth baseball games, I think that it's, it's not big enough for you know kids pitching the ball and hitting it out no. of the park. That's not going to work. But it you know, certainly works for realize. certainly works for t-ball and machine pitch and things like mm -hmm. that. So I, I think that there's some options for that. So, Ms. Sandy, you were right when you made this quote in here about kids getting hit with the ball and dogs chasing the ball around if there's dogs there or somebody. Yeah, it, just don't, it don't work. Come on. Mm -hmm. Now, a couple of suggestions. Let's find, we bought 10 acres over here. Why, why can't we designate some property over there for a, a nice park like you got going into Louisville or you got going into Boulder? All over you can find nice parks instead of halfway parks. You know what I mean? Let's get something that we'll be proud of here. Now, what about the Ambrose property? That's an acre and, and some uh, down there at the south end. That's just a suggestion. I didn't look into it, but I got thinking about it. You got the railroad track from there all the way down to for parking up in that area. George, you're, you're uh, predating me. I don't know the Ambrose property. So when we put yeah. it down here, Thank you. we bought an alley. Okay, got that it. We give away years ago. Okay. You know what I'm talking yeah. about. Uh, I've actually, Mason, Ma 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 George, I've had this conversation with some people just informally on ProStack, and, and they have <coughs> entertained a lot of these ideas. Mm -hmm. So I guess in the interim, if maybe you you can have a casual conversation with the ProStack uh, chairperson, but I really do think um, this has. I mean, I've heard it myself for years, as have all we, all of us. I think it's time for us maybe to bring it forth and and put some uh, potential. I, I appreciate your support, ideas. I, and I wish the rest of you would look into it. I, you know, I've lived here for many, many, many years. We got nothing, and it's just disgusting because I don't got many, many years to live. <laughs> Come on, I'm getting up there. I think we can get a feel. And I like to see this before I'm. Pass there, you you can uh, uh, hopefully there'll be a ball field and you can throw out the first pitch. I'll sure do it. <laughs> okay. right. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks. Thank you, George. Additional public comment. The 
is uh, Larry Dorsey, 940 uh, Riverbend Street, Superior, and um, I normally talk to you about issues around the uh, Historical Commission, and uh, we are going to be participating in the One Book Program at the museum on September 3rd, and I'll have some of our, what we jokingly call our artifacts, can speak about life during the, uh, or living artifacts, life during the Depression days and the uh, Dust Bowl days. We also have something in the, in the works which isn't uh, uh, well defined yet about uh, having to do with the cemetery in October. So we have the date set aside, I think it's October 17th. We're going to do something uh, in uh, connection with uh, uh, the Excuse me. The cemetery has maybe do some role playing, or at least uh, show people around if they'd be interested in, in learning more about the Superior Cemetery. But my uh, my real purpose for coming this evening is that um, there's a problem in my neighborhood in Rock Creek anyway, and I don't know if it's true throughout Rock Creek. I think about it has to be because a certain inevitability there. And I'm not sure about the uh, original Superior or Sagamore, but that problem is the fireworks. Um, what um, has grown to be a what I think is a pretty uh, pretty serious problem in terms of the uh, frequency and the magnitude of the fireworks. They they seem to be going constantly, and um, I once served in the artillery, and some of those sound like some pretty pretty big. Uh, uh, sometimes I'm wondering, oh, that sounds kind of familiar. But uh, uh, so some people have uh, are are bringing out some some heavy duty fireworks. Um, it's not just in June and July and August. It, uh, it goes most any time of the year when the weather's pretty good. Some kids seem to break out the firecrackers. And then it increases as the weather gets better, warmer. And, uh, of course, by the middle of June and the latter part of June, it's uh, every night in a full-scale fusillade. And then eventually by July 4th, it's, uh, um, you know, we hunker down and get ready, put on, put on your hard hats. Um, the problem is that many of these people using the fireworks are underage, which brings up a whole variety of issues. One is how do they get them, and especially and they're illegal fireworks, which is to say that somebody who's grown up is making the old run to Wyoming to get the stuff that is not legal in Colorado. Um, another problem is that the uh, parents are very much involved because obviously they're the ones that are um, trafficking in the fireworks, and um, and as I look out my window frequently, what I see is the dads right in the middle of the fracas um, tossing firecrackers left and right and uh, all that sort of thing. Another problem is the noise, and the noise is obvious, that it's noisy, but I know a lot of us with pets know that the, uh, in case of my case specifically, uh, my dog almost uh, comes apart at the seams. I think she's just Start shaking down into a little little pile of dust eventually, um, and what, what bothers me is that I would go out and talk to the kids, and one of the things I say to them is, "Don't you guys have a dog?" "Yeah." It's, "Doesn't this bother them?" "Yeah." And then they just kind of have a, a goofy look on their face. "Yeah." So that's what happens. Um, then there's also a lot of trash, a lot of waste from this. I walk through one particular open space that has a pond in it, there by Pitkin and. Um, Carvel, and um, the, the um, sidewalk is strewn with uh, spent firecrackers and the boxes that came in and all that sort of stuff. And of course, then there's the, the waste on our own property, all the neighbors' property. Uh, there's a fire hazard, as I see it. Um, one of the dads I talked with about toning this thing down said, "Well, somebody up in Wiggins or whatever, they shoot them off into the into the um, open space." Well, uh, that I think has a lot of uh, potential for setting uh, uh, native grasses on fire and so forth. And of course, uh, many houses in our area still have uh, shake shingle roofs, which uh, has a potential too. Um, well, there's the problem, and I'm seeing some uh, signs of agreement um, on the board. And so, what's the next thing to do? And I think I would like to suggest that. Uh, this board take a stand, and um, along with the homeowners association, the sheriff's department, and the fire department, and make a concerted effort to get the word out uh, through uh, information, education, or whatever. Um, I, I think fire departments oftentimes have um, demonstration 
things they can take to a school and show kids what happens when a firecracker goes off and uh, potentially blow off a hand or something. And sometimes I look out there and they're doing the bottle rockets and they're, they're bending over looking into the bottle to make sure everything is going okay. Um, so there's a, lot, there's a lot of hazards connected with this. I, I, I wish we could have a team of, uh, from the Sheriff's Department, Fire Department, anybody else who's expert in the field to go to the schools, get the, get the word to the middle school and high school students, uh, get the publicity out to the adults through all the various outlets like our publications and uh, homeowners association and town publications. And then uh, I know that it would be impossible to try to take care of all the infractions that are going on by our sheriff's department, but uh, I think since it's an illegal act, maybe enforce it at some point. And, uh, and that's my concern, Thank sharing you with much. you about uh, the explosion of fireworks in our community. So that's my I had to get one, one, They're very nice. one pun in there, but yeah. uh, yes. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, there is somebody from the Sheriff's Department this evening, Sergeant Timberland. I don't know if uh, you could speak to this. I think that, it, like you say, this is an enforcement nightmare, I would imagine. But Sergeant Chairman of the Sheriff's Office, um, we have issued several tickets this year for fireworks. The problem is most of the time the officers are out. There's one officer in town that's driving around, and you see him going off, and by the time you get there, they're gone. And then you see them over here, and by the time you get there, they're gone. We actually had three fires started in town oh my gosh. Um, by fireworks <coughs> on the 4th of July. They're all grass, small grass fires that were quickly contained. Statewide, or metro area-wide, there were seven homes that were burned down because of fireworks this way. Um, and like he said, they are just on the 4th of July because some of the takes we issued were Saturday night. So they're still going on. If we catch them, we're writing them and, mm -hmm. and confiscating them. And it's important for residents to call in, call the sheriff's department. Yeah, if you see them and you know who it is, call us and tell us who it is and that you saw them going off. We'll be happy to write. And are, are we discussing what's legal in Colorado, or are we also discussing the ones that are illegal coming from Wyoming? No. We're just talking about the in illegal. Illegal. Well, illegal. E yeah. illegal. Yeah. If it's legal, we're not going to write them for it. Yeah. Jesse Pennington. Uh, we have met with the HOA. Um, to determine areas of cross collaboration so I would suggest that we use this maybe uh, going into next year um, maybe the May window um, first of June window since this starts happening as Larry said pretty early on that both entities via their newsletters and their various mechanisms can say what is allowed and what's not allowed because I think doesn't the HOA have certain rules and the town has rules? Let's all just get together and, and use our various uh, educational means to educate the public. The, we do, but the HOA doesn't have specific rules related to right. that. This but at least let's use our, our uh, means. I, I can come up with a better newsletter for next year for fireworks as a bomb tech. I mean, fireworks is the most hazardous thing I do with my mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, fireworks disposal is the haz most hazardous thing I do as, as a bomb tech. So they are right. dangerous. Well, and maybe if you can write a piece for the Sentinel, you know, the June Sentinel. It's a little late for the July Sentinel, but if you can do it for June, and you can share that. Ex August. 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 No, June. June. Next year. Next year. August is good, too. I'll do one to yeah. have for August. Yeah, you can do it for August, but what I'm trying to do is do it ahead of the, the heavy threat. So I'm, I'm thinking of it next June to where we can all collaborate, educate uh, residents as to what is allowed, what's illegal, and what the consequences of that will be. By then we'll have go report uh, online. You know, we can maybe have some community activism to use that. Um, so there are some things at our disposal. Jessica Gross. I mean, I, I think, Larry, you're totally right. You didn't exaggerate one bit when it comes to that. <laughs> My dog shakes the same thing, hides under the bed. They go off way past 10 p.m., usually go, sometimes in the morning, late at night, all over the place. And 4th of July celebrated for 60 days straight, it seems like, so it's, and it would be a tragedy if we had, like, even if we lost one home, if one family was homeless because of a fire in, in, in Superior, that would be a huge tragedy, so. I didn't realize seven homes were lost this year, that's, in metro area, yeah. wow. Two in my neighborhood in front Really? Right. Wow. Jeez. Thank you. So, thank you, Larry, for bringing it up. Okay. Additional public comment? Uh, 
Jim Payne, 2475 Clayton Circle. I chair the ProStack, which is the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee to you, the board, and the town. Um, maybe I can clarify to Mr. Kupner's comment on the baseball field. I think looking at the uh, draft minutes that covered the presentation at the last meeting, that's probably a uh, poor choice of words. It says game quality, that a game quality field was eliminated. I think the um, it's fair to say that we don't see that a um, full sanctioned little league competitive field with proper parking and all the other uh, parts of that would be would fit or be appropriate in Town Nine Park. But we are committed to having a quality baseball youth baseball field in there. And the board will be presented with different options um, from less elaborate to more elaborate and we'll see how far we can go, both in terms of money and in terms of um, what the park will, will take. But I, I I'd like to see that changed in the minutes if it still can be changed. Because I'm not sure I'd change, you know, I, I wouldn't change the minutes, but I think your comments tonight are a clarification. So, I mean, once again, I think we're all sort of on the same page that we, you know, we're going to have a discussion about this and realizing that 360-foot fences are not going to be, right. you know, they're not, geometry is not going to work for that, but there's... Prostack is, we're certainly committed to mm -hmm. having a quality baseball facility in yep. Town Nine Park. Great. Thank you. Additional public comment? Okay. That uh, brings us to item number six uh, presentations, and tonight we have a proclamation, which I'm delighted to read. And um, I, you know, just uh, we have a lot of volunteers in committee. This we're going to rep, uh, recognize one tonight. But you know, between dads coaching uh, youth sports, moms coaching youth sports, uh, you know, Cub Scouts, Scouts. I mean, it's it's a great community to live in because of the volunteers. So, uh, with that, I'm. I'd like to read a proclamation of the Board of Trustees of the Town of Superior. In appreciation of the superior volunteer service of Cool River Church, whereas Cool River Church and its members are active contributors to our society by donating their time and talents to improving lives and strengthening the superior community, and the volunteers from Bowling Green, Kentucky, hosted by Cool River Church, have spent numerous hours of their own time and energy to work at the Superior Fourth of July event, and a significant amount of their time was invested in the work on the town's trail system, contributing to the efforts to improve the quality recreation experience. And the Cool River Church has consistently been involved in community events and demonstrated a sustained commitment to volunteer services. And Cool River Church and their guest volunteers from Kentucky are commended for their dedica uh, dedicated efforts to help make our community a better place to live. I, Andrew Muckle, therefore uh, proclaim it's a, the town's appreciation to Cool River Church for their significant contribution to the community and encourage all citizens to follow the example that this fine, fine organization has shown us on the act of volunteer, volunteerism. So with that, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Kevin Cologne, uh, 1067 Raymer Lane, pastor of Cool River Church. Uh, this is obviously greatly appreciated. Wanted to add a little detail. Those uh, volunteers from Bowling Green, Kentucky came from Living Hope Baptist Church uh, in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and they had a blast. I want to say a special thanks to uh, Martin uh, and Alan and Matt uh, who helped uh, with that project and uh, obviously the Town of Superior as a whole, the Chamber of Commerce at the 4th of July, uh, all events, uh, also helped us out uh, a great deal, and the kids just had a, a great time here. Um, our mission as Cool River is to love God and love people, and uh, we hope we get to do that for many, many years here in this town. Thank you guys so much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. All right, with that, uh, we come to the consent agenda. On the consent agenda this evening is approval of the minutes of the June 27, 2011 Board of uh, Trustees meeting, consideration of an alcohol permit on public property for the Superior Chamber of Commerce. And I think that's it. So 
uh, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda by Trustee Gregoria, second by Trustee Williams. Discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. That uh, brings us to item number eight, presentation and discussion regarding recycle oil at the yard waste facility. Mr. Magley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, staff has met with uh, the company Recycle Oil earlier this year about uh, the potential of adding a service to our yard waste facility. And, we, and um, after meeting with them and hearing about their service that they provide and the, and the organization they have and the municipalities that they currently serve, we thought it might be a good use to add for our residents um, to be able to use their services to recycle their used cooking oil. Um, and so we asked them to come forward tonight to give a presentation to the board about their service that they provide, how it works, how it, and how it would operate. Um, the Recycling and Conservation Advisory Committee has, has met with them and has, is recommending that um, we move forward with the service and uh, after tonight's meeting, if the board is, is comfortable with, um, with this service, we will work with them to see that it's implemented. But we wanted to make sure and bring it before the board first because it, you know, we are proposing the yard waste facility and you know, we thought it would be good just to, to have you hear um, their proposal and, Great. and get your input. Thanks. So with that, welcome. Thank you very much for your time. My name is Jason Barton. I'm with Recycle Oil. I'm here with my colleague Zane Kessler. Um, and thank you very much to Jay for your help in facilitating this, as well as to all of you for your time. Um, Great. Um, I understand time is short, and so I'll, I'll move through this very quickly and then can entertain any questions that, that anyone has. Um, our office is right up the road in Boulder, and uh, we provide used cooking oil recycling services for about 1,600 commercial kitchens, mostly restaurants around the state of Colorado as well as southern Wyoming. Um, we work mostly on service, making sure that this is taken care of, um, that our containers are kept clean. We are, of course, fully compliant with all local, state, and federal regulations. Um, very high environmental performance is part of what inspired the starting of this company about six years ago and also making sure that the economic performance in times especially like now when these prices are high that we're paying restaurants and our other customers as much as possible for the oil that we collect and recycle for them. One of our programs that's of interest I think to you would be the holiday recycle oil program um, that's the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Deep fried turkeys were something that did not sound appetizing to me when I first heard about them, um, but they're actually not bad and they've really caught on. It's been a, a big issue for a lot of towns um, what to do with that oil after that's done. And so we, not only do we have um, year-round recycling in a number of municipalities around Colorado, we also offer that at additional locations like Mile High Stadium and others that are a one-day only um, service. And so the idea is just with, with Superior and other municipalities, how can we help? Um, because this is an issue that touches on a number of, of areas. Um, this is an, an agricultural issue, it's an energy issue, it's a climate issue, and most immediate, I think, for municipalities, it's a water issue. And if you've seen any of the pictures from the inside of sewer pipes, especially close to a lot of restaurant facilities, um, this is the easiest thing to do with this oil, unfortunately, is just dump it down the drain. And so that becomes a cost to the city, and so this is something that we'd like to avoid and deal with it in a much more environmentally responsible manner. Um, the way that we've been working when this company started, the way that we're working now is, is to recycle these used oils, to our, uh, bring them to our plant up in Berthoud, Colorado. It's a two million gallon a year facility where we recycle this and then sell it to biodiesel manufacturers in the region. Um, and I understand that video isn't necessarily um, the easiest thing to facilitate and time is short. We were recently up at Red Rocks, uh, which is another one of our customers, fueling up Willie Nelson's buses there. And so taking this, I get a lot of jokes about when we <laughs> We didn't anticipate that when we started. We were just excited because he's been a biodiesel uh, supporter. Uh, the American Lung Association and Clean Cities of Colorado was there along with the Sustainable Biodiesel Alliance. And so making this a regionally sustainable initiative where we're taking what used to be garbage and helping to convert it to an energy resource that can be used here and it makes for cleaner air and has a lot of other positive externalities in terms of the service that we provide. 
Some of our more notable customers, Elitch Gardens and Invesco Field at Mile High Stadium. We work with all the Chipotles around Colorado as well as all the Whole Foods. Um, there are other shopping malls, office centers. We work with uh, most of the universities in Colorado, University of Colorado, Colorado State, University of Northern Colorado. And so this is a service that a lot of different commercial and public um, other private entities have signed on to and we're proud to be working with them as our partners. And so we'd like to be able to provide this service to Superior, if at all possible, and in ways that uh, are going to work well for you for your yard waste facility. And so with that, happy to answer questions. Any other municipalities or cities that you're working with? Yes, we work with uh, many of them. Of course, I'm going to blank on them now. Um, Fort Collins is one that is recently, well, within the last year, they actually work through two private locations. The Habitat for Humanity Restore has uh, our container, and another store called Eco Thrift. Um, which it has a, they do a lot of recycling, heavy metals, electronics, those kinds of things. So Fort Collins, the city facilitated that, um, those locations, and now we work directly with those private locations. Um, on our website, we have a list of several more. Um, we got we have um, in Longmont as well. Uh, Broomfield, Evergreen, Longmont. Okay. And, and let's say we went uh, along with this. How does this actually actual work? Okay. How will this work? Good question. Um, we try to make this as worry-free for most of our customers, restaurant employees, managers, owners are very, very busy. So we would deliver a barrel or two, depending on your space. Um, we could, as I've spoken with Jay, we could chain that to something at your facility. We have a lid that just sits right on top. We can put a lever lock on that lid to keep it more, more secure. Most of our customers say we don't want that. It just creates another step and invites another opportunity for it to be spilled or thrown into the garbage as opposed to the barrel. Um, ideally, because your volume would be difficult to predict initially and because it may be variable since you're only working over the summer, if there is somebody on staff who could just take a look and say it's half full, three quarters full, we can come by. If that's impossible, you're right on the route. It's very easy for us just to come by and keep track and that's what we do for those customers. When they're going through substantial volumes and at fairly regular rates, we keep track of how much oil we get each time we go so that we know when to get back there before the barrel gets full, before anyone has to call us so that again, this isn't an issue that takes their time, but we do it on our end, managing those data in order to make sure that... So let me understand, so we as residents would take our cooking oil and take it down to waste... To the yard waste. To the yard waste uh -huh. and dump it in a barrel, right. in essence. Yep. That's it, it's very That's simple. It. Our truck come by, comes by and picks it up, uh, the 55 gallon steel drums. We do have the big dumpster style containers, but the smaller ones, I think for these purposes especially, are more practical. It's also very efficient to switch those out if, uh, if you know they start to get dirty if over time. Um, it's easy to pick them up and, and leave clean one there at the facility and bring oh. the dirty ones back to our plant to be washed. Sounds like a good plan. Thanks to you, Williams. So do you envision um, businesses to use this as well? If they would like, certainly. If they're going through any volume of oil, we'd be happy to deliver a barrel. There's no charge to you or to those businesses at any point. We make our money again by recycling this and selling it to biodiesel manufacturers. Um, and so there isn't a cost to the town. So is the yard waste facility um, open to not just superior residents, but say Louisville, um, Broomfield, Boulder? Yeah, they're open. yeah we, I mean, we don't, it's, we don't check residents to make sure they're living in town when they drop off their limbs. We just make, what we check for now is to make sure that they're not dumping trash and stuff. Right. Like and do you service um, Broomfield or Louisville? We do service Broomfield. 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 I'm actually meeting with uh, Mary I'm sorry Harris. if you, um, yeah, so, just at the mic if you wouldn't mind uh, terribly. We're, I'll be talking with uh, Heather Balser in Louisville okay. here next week. I've worked with her in the past and um, also having lunch with Mayor Sisk sometime in the next couple of weeks. So we're talking with them about getting a facility across the room. And what about Boulder? Do we have one? Not in, this, not in the city of Boulder proper, no. Okay. And, but you do uh, service Broomfield? Yes. Uh -huh. I believe we have a municipal drop-off location in Broomfield. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Trustee Pennington. First, uh, kudos to Yard Waste. For the first time ever this weekend, we uh, used it. And man, was it of great it's value. It was yeah, wonderful, it's and so um, that that doesn't okay. pertain to this, but for the typical residential customer, I guess I don't have any huge quantity of leftover grease. I mean, I don't deep fry. Do you deep fry? 
Sometimes my and I don't know what to do with it. I, my wife does, and I don't know what to do with it. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. I don't want to dump it. We, yeah. we don't know what to do with it. So I'm, I'm, I think this is wonderful, but I, I'm, I guess I'm thinking for me, do I really just save the the dregs from the? I mean, what is the profile of the typical residential customer? It's a good question. I, I have a, a lot of very active and healthy friends, and we don't use a lot of a, a lot of oil at home. Um, and, and maybe I should be embarrassed to admit that as a representative <laughs> <laughs> that I fry a lot of food. But it is, I mean, some people do, depending on what kind of, of style. I know that, you know, from being a little kid all the way up until now, if I make bacon in the morning, that goes into a pop can, you know, next to the sink, and you have to wait for it to So you're actually you looking for away. that stuff? I mean, to us, to our business, the quantity of oil that we would probably get um, from Superior is going to be very minimal. So it's not so much a matter of us increasing the volume of oil that we're getting. It's more of helping to make sure that this oil isn't going into the sewers, that it's not going into landfills, where it can also create problems because then it seeps so down. So you want anything that's been cooked in, the dregs of we anything can, cooked in oil you know, can be deposited in that we look at the number of okay. restaurants, it's, you know, it comes from chickens, it comes from bacon, it comes from used fryer oil, it may be vegetables, soy, canola. Um, and so we can process that. Okay. That's our job at our plant. Um, and so that's not really the town's concern. It's mainly just, you know, let's make sure that there is a place for anybody who does use a fair amount of oil to have a place to dispose of that responsibly wow. as opposed to drawing it down. Okay. And other than cooking oil, which you just mentioned, canola, you know, peanut oil, sapphire, safflower, um, is there any other kind of oil? Like popcorn, when you get oil at the bottom sure. there, that counts no, too. No, 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 no motor oil. No, no motor oil. oil. No petroleum products. Okay. Motor oil, no. <laughs> cooking oil. Right. won't work. Cooking, other yeah. than that, we can, any kind of cooking oil, food-based oil, whether it's animal or vegetable, we can take care of it. Other questions? So my only comment, well, I have a couple. Uh, great concept. I uh, think it would be very helpful, uh, speaking for the water district, we don't want to have stuff in our pipes that we then have to go clean out or have to process again. My concern is that uh, the yard waste site is only open certain days of the week and only certain times of the year. So if we really want to maximize this, it would be better to partner somehow with um, a location that would be open more frequently. And I don't know if there is a business model where you, you know, it sounds like you might pay some people money for you know picking up the oil it seems like it might make the most sense to somehow partner with a business within town or in Louisville or someplace else uh, to hum somehow you know you drop it off free they make some money you make you make money so I don't know if well, that's a way to we do could this. have multiple locations I mean we could have this now mm -hmm. at the yard waste site but then also look maybe partner with Louisville if you do end up doing something with them to where mm -hmm. if it's open more frequently our residents can maybe over there as well. Yeah. I mean, there's no, at least from my perspective, I don't think there's any, you know, there's no cost to us. It's small. Correct. You can take it away if it doesn't work. Correct. Uh, Correct. So, I mean, I, I guess there's really no downside to try to see how this goes. Uh, okay. But then in the future, try to somehow work with a, you know, business where it'd be a win win for everybody and so that you don't have to wait, you know, don't want to collect this for, you know, a month and a half waiting to, you know, put it someplace. I think that would be. You know, helpful. You know, residents are not going to do that, right? I mean, some will, but some, you know, a big number will be like, well, if I can't do it today or tomorrow, I'm going to put it down the drain or I'm going to put it in the trash. So, sure, it's it's a good point, and I think your first idea is is, is probably the most practical. Um, this would be something that would work in the short term. Um, going back to Fort Collins, of those two, you know, private commercial locations that we have, one um, eco thrift does a lot of promoting. I, I don't know exactly how he does it, but he collects a lot of oil. Mm -hmm. And so he gets paid money for that oil, and for him it's it's a nice thing. It, inter it increases the foot traffic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, other places, it's it's there. It's on their website. It's on our website. Any mm -hmm. town announcements you have. Mm -hmm. When we do the holiday recycle oil, there's generally a bit of news coverage, and that's another opportunity for us to say there's also a barrel in Superior mm -hmm. that's open these days and these months. You know, the more that you can promote it, the more successful it is. Mm -hmm. At the very least, it's an opportunity for those who, mm -hmm. like all of us, you know, those, those rare occasions, gosh, what am I going to do with this? Mm -hmm. um, now you have an opportunity. So we're happy to work with you however you see fit in order and, to make it. And do you have com uh, commercial operators? And I mean, do you have restaurants that you coordinate with somewhere? For in public, the, 
uh -huh. for public disposal. We don't. And, and, and I heard Whole Foods that that seems like a good idea. They're frankly not interested in, sure. in having you know people dispose of their waste. Um, Whole Foods does it right outside their kitchen, and that way it's their staff and they're monitoring mm -hmm. that closely. Mm -hmm. But having it open to the public um, mm -hmm. isn't something that at least Whole Foods has been interested in. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, I would be happy to speak if you have ideas. And I, I think Jay and I may, and I, you know, we deal with several different municipalities. It's often discussed exactly this matter. And, and mm -hmm. if you have an idea, someone I should approach, I'm happy to talk with them and, and do that legwork because mm -hmm. I understand that your time is limited. So I might coordinate somehow with the chamber with their business contacts to see if anybody has, you know, put the word out, see if anybody's interested in, in that. So at least mm -hmm. an initial thought, Trustee Williams. So can I ask a uh, very stupid logistical question? Please. So I'm deep frying something, which I never do, but say I am. Your neighbor is deep frying something. <laughs> you, you have a feeling. I, I, have I, have I, I am deep frying that turkey. Okay. And uh, I pour it into a can with the leftover oil. It hardens. And the next time the facility is open, um, I'm going to take that with this can, and I'm going to do... What with it? Am I going to dump the can? Um, no, not not. I'm going to keep the oil back have up. The can itself, but even if it's hardened, we can still take care of it. Um, it but she's got to scoop it out. I, I'm, I'm asking with it. Yeah. I don't want to get into you know, get graphic details, but, but sure. <laughs> Um, you know that works. We work 12 months a year. We work high up in the mountains in Montana, or in, I'm sorry, in Colorado, and in, in places where it, it gets cold, and that happens. And restaurants have to deal with this. Sometimes they empty out their fryers late at night, and, and you know those employees don't want to touch this stuff when it's hot. That's a safety issue. So you've got to let it cool, and then you know how they get it into our container. You is some, right. That, 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 they, they do it that's not your problem. Yeah, right. They do it that way. And, and then how we get it out and how we process it, that's our problem. And so if it is okay. colder and, and, you know, it's hardened, that we'll take care of it how we need to. So what will you do if people throw with a can in the barrel? And again, that, that becomes our problem. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that's done at our plant in Berthoud where it's, that's all cleaned out. That, that what's inside of there is a valuable product to us. And so we will do what we need to do in order to make sure that we're getting as much of that as possible, um, being very efficient in getting that material back to be recycled. Um, and, and sometimes, as you can imagine, with that many customers in downtown Denver, for example, all sorts of things end up in those barrels. And so that, that's our problem. We don't want to make that our customers' problems. Okay. All right. Thank you. Next helpful. steps, Mr. Magley. Uh, uh, we'll work with... Uh, Recycle oil to um, have it implemented at the yard waste site, and then once once we have the details done and the barrels there, then we'll get to start advertising to residents to let them know it's there. We obviously don't want to make this look like an industrial waste dumping area. Yep, yep. Uh, so you know whatever you need to do to, I mean maybe for the short term, fine. You know put a couple of barrels there, but we don't want it to look like industrial waste. And so mm -hmm. you know if they're screening it, you know long term. We'd want to consider that, so there might be some budgetary impact associated with that. And again, right around the holiday times may be a good time to remind your constituents that uh, this is a service that's available yeah. to them for free. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Anything else about this? Wow. That's awesome. We're ahead of schedule on a short meeting. <laughs> uh, anything else to come before the board tonight? Happy birthday, Phyllis, one more time. <laughs> See, you guys are dedicated and employed right there. Right, right there. Came to the board meeting. Absolutely. <laughs> Seeing nothing else, then meeting adjourned. Thank you.